name's Carl Schmidt. Um, I'm a researcher at a laboratory called LATMOS in, in Paris, France, and I study planetary atmospheres there. Um, I work mostly with ground-based telescopes and some modeling. I, I don't often use spacecraft data. Um, and with ground-based telescopes, there are uh, only specific applications where we can really learn more um, about certain aspects of planetary atmospheres than we could from a spacecraft. And obviously, spacecrafts are um, a very expensive investment um, that takes years of preparation. So we want to maximize ground-based support for, for spacecrafts um, by combining telescope resources around the world. And a lot of those resources can come from small telescopes. Small telescopes are more available, they're cheaper to operate, uh, and they're generally undersubscribed. So, um, you can do long-term campaigns on them in a way that you can't with the world's largest and most expensive and newest telescopes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those applications today. And in general, in order to do science with small telescopes, you need a very specific niche application. Um, in order for you to um, be able to successfully image an atmosphere, um, you need to look at something bright. Um, there isn't a whole lot of light coming from uh, most objects, and your collecting power is going to be sensitive to how large the telescope is, so you need to pick a bright target. Um, that said, even in telescopes that are you know, the size of this room, most of the sort of low-hanging fruit of science has already been picked. We've really um, been making observations of uh, the solar system planets and comets for uh, several decades. And in order to do something new, we really need to focus on a specific application. And that's particularly true if we're using small telescopes. So the applications that I'm talking about here are specific to certain objects. And those objects here are Jupiter's moon, Io, and Earth's moon, and the first planet from the sun, Mercury, and the atmospheres of comets, comets that are constantly losing their material as they're falling into the sun and have their own atmospheres. To me, Io is the most interesting body in the solar system because it's, it's always active, and it's a great target for smaller telescopes because if you look at it one day, and if you look at it a week later, it changes. And uh, when, when we're using ground-based telescopes for monitoring those changes, we can, we can learn physically interesting things. And uh, it gives you something new to study, even though it's been uh, studied for a long time, because we don't really understand its behavior yet. So, I was volcanically active because it's very close to Jupiter. And Jupiter, it's the largest mass in the solar system. That mass causes tidal heating inside of Io, gives it um, uh, some molten material, which forms 200 active volcanic plumes on the surface. Uh, they're not all plumes. They're, some of them are lava lakes. But there's, there's active volcanic sites in about 200 locations, most of which were identified by the Galileo spacecraft. With small telescopes, you can study that volcanism at wavelengths in the near infrared, uh, where you can look at thermal emission from those volcanoes. But you can also study Io's atmosphere and what's called the Io plasma torus, what happens when that atmosphere gets ionized and trapped in Jupiter's magnetic field, starts rotating around Jupiter, and forms a structure called the Io plasma torus. The atmosphere of Io, it's certainly driven by volcanism, but it's not really clear whether those volcanoes actually loft material up into the 
upper atmosphere and it stays there, or if that hot material rains down onto the surface, heats up the surface, and then the surface gives a sublimated atmosphere where it goes directly from solid state into a gas because the pressure is so low it can do that. So that's one application for IO in small telescopes. And there's lots of different things that we can learn on IO. For Mercury and the Moon, the atmosphere is very, very thin. Um, the whole atmosphere of the planet of Mercury or of Earth's moon is comparable to a few times the amount of air in this room, spread over the whole planet. Um, but that's plenty of atoms and molecules to, to do statistics on and to have interesting dynamics. Um, and it's particularly interesting because uh, the plasmas of space can interact directly with the surface, whereas when plasmas interact with the Earth, uh, they have to go through Earth's atmosphere, Earth's magnetosphere, and they cause things like aurora, whereas they actually cause the atmosphere itself on uh, the Moon and on Mercury. We still, like Io, don't fully understand how that atmosphere is created on Mercury and on the Moon. So we can learn directly about the sources of what's causing the atmosphere and sustaining the atmosphere in the long term. And they have seasons, just like the Earth has seasons. Um, you can see changes in the atmosphere as uh, the, the Moon orbits the Earth and as Mercury orbits the Sun. And Mercury has a very unusual orbit. And as far as bodies in our solar system go, but not as unusual as comets, um, which are a great target for small telescope observations. When cometary atmospheres that are expanding, um, you see light that's due to gas, uh, that's due to dust, and that's due to ionized material, that's due to plasma. And each of those are interesting in their own ways. Um, with a small telescope, you can constrain, you can learn about the relative abundance of what a comet is made out of. And that might be uh, pristine as, as primordial material, the first building blocks of our solar system. Comets are so far away, you know, 10,000 times the distance between Earth and the sun, that they haven't been processed by sunlight over geological timescales. So that material is still relatively new, relatively fresh, um, without processing. And we can study a lot of what the early solar system is made out of by looking at what's being off-gassed from, from comets. Uh, a lot of the molecules and, and atoms that we observe in comets, they don't come from the comet directly. They come off as one species, you know, water, and then they get photoionized, electron impact ionized, uh, uh, chemistry happens within a comet's atmosphere that can turn that into hydrogen and oxygen. And we're often studying the daughter products of the molecules and, and, even, and even the dust and the ice that's coming off of comets directly. Uh, so there's a lot to be learned and the tools with a wide array of undersubscribed small telescopes that are cheap to operate are the perfect tools to, to do these. And especially for supporting spacecraft missions, um, we, wanna, we wanna think about what's, what's the best way to, um, to, to utilize these resources that are widely available. So first observatory I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, called Fan Mountain Observatory in Virginia. It's operated by the University of Virginia. And it's just an example of a small uh, facility which um, has really interesting instruments, but um, the number of uh, people applying to this telescope doesn't fully meet the available time. It's undersubscribed. So you can use a telescope like this for um, long-term monitoring, where you don't have to discover something new every night. You can use it to measure how something is changing over time without wasting resources and, and time. So this is a less than a one meter aperture. It's about 78 centimeters. It's got an eight arc minute field of view and it operates in the infrared. And that's what makes it unique is because 
uh, at wavelengths more red than, than you and I can see, uh, the, the observable solar system is, is very different. And those properties uh, are less explored than, than visible light and often even than ultraviolet light, which you need to, to observe from a spacecraft in order to see through the atmosphere. The observing wavelengths um, fall into sort of slots in, in the atmosphere where you can see through it. Um, those bands are two to three times longer wavelength than we can observe with our eyes. And uh, you use different filters to switch between those, those bands where you just isolate uh, light at a range of wavelengths where you can see through the atmosphere as transparent. Um, so we've got an infrared instrument on this that was, that was built by uh, graduate students completely that operates at cryogenic temperatures. Um, and we can use that to study the volcanoes that are um, constantly erupting on Io. So in infrared light, uh, most of these volcanic sites were mapped out by the spacecraft Galileo. Um, if we look at Io in visible light, this image on the left here, it's sort of a, it's sort of a messy pizza. Um, the, the surface has uh, these, these pockets of different colors. Some are orange, some are black, some are yellow. Um, that material uh, is, is actually material that was volcanically lofted and has rained back down to the surface to change the color of the surface locally. And when we look in infrared light, we see bright spots at a lot of those locations that correspond to hot material um, that's the magma of Io's volcanoes, actually emitting thermal infrared light. So it'd be nice if we had images uh, like this of Io's volcanoes all the time, but that one came from a spacecraft. Here's a nice, beautiful image of one of these volcanic plumes going off on Io during the New Horizons flyby in 2007. But we can't have spacecrafts constantly monitoring the volcanic activity of this moon. Um, so it's a great application for, for small telescopes to uh, do the regular sort of uh, baseline of what is the volcanic activity on this moon of Jupiter. So the data from Van Mountain Observatory, this, uh, this small telescope in the infrared there, uh, is making this movie in, in the center. Uh, this is taken over about a 45 minute time period. And it happens when Io is in Jupiter's eclipse. It's in Jupiter's eclipse to block out the reflected sunlight from the surface of Io. Io is so shiny, and our sun is still emitting so much light in the infrared, that uh, if we just look at Io at any time in the infrared, we'll see mostly reflected sunlight, and the volcanoes will be hard to detect. Whereas when Io is in Jupiter's shadow, all of the light that we see in the infrared is coming from thermal emission from, from the volcanoes. And so you can use times when Io is actually behind Jupiter in its shadow, uh, but the Earth is to one side so you can still see it in order to just isolate that emission which is from the volcanism itself. So, Io is popping out of uh, the side here, and this, this, this bright arc is the, the edge of Jupiter. And Io is in, in full shot. All of that light that we're seeing is coming from the volcanoes. Um, that small dot next to it is another moon of Jupiter called Amalthea. Um, and Amalthea is actually in full sunlight. It's just a very small moon, and it's very faint. Uh, when Io comes out of eclipse, that's this bright flare-up that we see, and all of that uh, saturated signal is the reflected sunlight from Io's surface. And of course, that would make it much, much harder to look at this tiny signal from the volcanoes. 
Each observation that you make like this with Io and Eclipse gives you a light curve for how that light varied over time, and you can get about a 45 minute window during Eclipse. Um, and the background of stars can be used for um, an absolute brightness reference because a lot of stars have uh, standardized flux in the infrared that are un unchanging. With uh, this small telescope, we've observed more than a factor of 10 change in the total volcanic output of Io over short time scales. So you can see these eruptions happening and monitor the volcanic activity of this moon as time goes on. It has some drawbacks in its, in its method in that you're always looking at one side of the moon, the side that's in eclipse. Um, the way around that is to look at one moon of Jupiter actually eclipsing another. Uh, you need to block out the sunlight somehow because the, it's so shiny, it's reflecting so much sunlight. And you can do that by blocking it out with Jupiter. But also another moon, Europa, is a little bit smaller than Io, so it's not ideal. But Ganymede or Callisto um, can fully block out Io's reflected sunlight for just a few minutes. And if you time it just right, you can make the measurement then as well. The optimum way to do this is by looking at wavelengths where there are absorption features in Jupiter's atmosphere. So that Jupiter is especially faint. The closer that we can get to Jupiter, the longer a time that we have to observe. And so if you look in the methane bands around 1.7 microns, where there's a lot of methane in Jupiter's atmosphere, all of that methane absorbing sunlight is going to make Jupiter very dark. And so you can look at something which is faint right next to Jupiter more easily. 